Hello, good evening. One of NATO's key allies in Libya, the leader of military forces in Tripoli, has alleged he was kidnapped and interrogated by the CIA and then turned over to Gaddafi. Abdul Hakim Belhaj claims he spent six years in prison for what the CIA claimed were his links to Al Qaeda, links he denies. Well, these are early days for new Libya. The strange bedfellows the revolutions created are only just emerging. Could this be the start of a series of embarrassing revelations about the relationship between Colonel Gaddafi and the West? Peter Marshall is here with a bit more. Peter. Well, there's more light being shed on the dark side of the, the war on terror, that's for sure. Thirty years ago, of course, Islamist fighting groups were America's great friends fighting the good fight against the Russians in Afghanistan. Ten years ago, that all changed with the war on terror. And uh, the enemy's enemy, Colonel Gaddafi, became the great friend. And now that's all changed again, and uh, we've got a former jihadist leading the fight against Gaddafi's forces in Tripoli. But he's revealing some embarrassing secrets. Suddenly everything's changed. The rebel force which took Tripoli is now the de facto army of the new Libya. The man who led them is Abdul Hakim Belhaj. Today we are witnessing a new revolution, which everyone is happy about. But the hero of this revolution, championed by NATO and America, has also said that just a few years ago he was being tortured by the CIA. Back in the 1990s, Belhaj led an Islamist guerrilla group fighting to overthrow Gaddafi. Then the Americans lent Gaddafi a hand. According to Belhaj, he was first detained at an airport in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in 2004. From there, he was taken to a secret prison in Bangkok, Thailand, where he says two CIA agents took a direct part in his torture. He doesn't give details. Days after that, he was handed to the Libyans, a gift from America to the Gaddafi regime. He was to spend six years in Tripoli's notorious Abu Salim prison. The CIA-Libya relationship is no surprise to Omar de Gaius. Libyan-born, he was locked up in Guantanamo Bay. And in September 2004, two Libyan intelligence officers turned up as his interrogators. They said that, we, that uh, your real enemy are not the Americans. Uh, we are your real enemies. You are our enemy. And they said things like, we will kill you when you're back. We, will, we came here to take you back to Libya. Uh, your real problems are in Libya where we will kill you. Uh, you're in, uh, clearly you're like the sun, you're in opposing Gaddafi regime and you're an enemy to, to the revolution and things like that. And they were making all sorts of threats. Were you worried? I was very, very worried because uh, the Americans kept uh, threatening with uh, handing us to the Libyans. Six years ago, Newsnight corroborated his story about Libyan agents in Guantanamo by following the logs of a CIA plane tracked from Washington, D.C. to Mitiga Airport, Tripoli, and back to Guantanamo Bay. So how are the old enemies and the new friends feeling now about this relationship with the Allied forces involved in Libya's revolution? Tim Huell is in Benghazi for us. <laughs> This young man I interviewed alongside his father earlier this year in the eastern city of Durna is one of hundreds who were jailed after fighting abroad against America. Though like most others, he says he wouldn't do that again. I went to Iraq for love of the country, to sacrifice myself because of what happened in Abu Ghraib jail and because of the occupation. Today in Benghazi, as every Friday, they were praying on the square that for months was the heart of the Libyan revolution. This is an overwhelmingly devout and socially conservative society, but one that now claims to be committed to pluralistic democracy. Libya's new leaders vehemently deny there's any major strain of Islamism in their revolution. And most former Islamists within their ranks say they long ago abandoned any extreme views they may once have held. Even so, some Western politicians, particularly in America, think Libya needs to be watched very carefully in future for any possible resurgence of radicalism. It was the murder just over a month ago of this man, the rebels' commander-in-chief, Abd Fattah Yunis, that most alarmed Libya's Western backers and many within the country. The investigations continuing, but both the National Transitional Council and Eunice's family 
say Islamist militiamen were to blame. They were an Islamic radical group who committed this execution and according to the eyewitnesses who have been with, with him, his uh, guards, so that people looked in a strange shape with a long beard, with, with their vocalization, the way that they spoke, where obviously it looks like people from from an extreme uh, background. No one's yet sure whether the Transitional Council can control radical groups or how far it may go to co-opt Islamists into its vision of the future. Libya's revolutionaries are so keen on legality that here on Benghazi waterfront amid the souvenir stalls with the hats and the bags you can also find a copy in Arabic and in English of the Libyan constitution. This isn't the new constitution, it's the constitution of the Libyan monarchy from 1951 and 1952 under the monarchy was the only year that Libya has ever had a proper election. But there is an interesting difference between this old 50s constitution and the new one that's been worked out very scrupulously by the National Transitional Council. Here you can see under the old one, Article 5, Islam is the religion of state. Now, under the new draft constitution, that's rather amplified to say that Sharia, Islamic law, will be the primary source of all future legislation here. That's a distinct difference that some people feel is a concession to Islamists. Tim Hill reporting there from Benghazi. We can speak now to Michael Scheuer, the former head of CIA Bin Laden unit in Washington. And from Edinburgh, Ming Campbell joins us, the uh, former leader of the Liberal Democrats. Gentlemen, thanks uh, very much to you both. Uh, Michael Scheuer, it's, it's pretty embarrassing, presumably, if this is proved that the Americans and Gaddafi uh, were working rather well together all the time. Why would that be embarrassing, ma'am? You know, Mr. Blair, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Mrs. Clinton, all went to, to Libya to kiss Mr. Gaddafi's butt after he gave up weapons of mass destruction. It's a funny way to phrase it that the CIA had a relationship with Libya. The United States government had a relationship with Libya, as did Great Britain, as did France, and as did all of their intelligence services. It's kind of a, this is kind of not a surprise, really. And is it something that you're proud of, or is it a source of regret? Certainly, I don't regret it. You know, you work with whoever you can work with to defend the United States. That's the, that's the bottom line. And our political leaders said that Gaddafi was a good guy now, and we should deal with him. You know, the intelligence services are not independent actors. At least in the United States, everything we would have done with Gaddafi would have been approved by Mr. Bush and had to be reapproved by Mr. Obama. Uh, Min Campbell, that's the truth of it, isn't it? Realpolitik uh, means that we've always worked with and indeed used dictators in the name of our own national security, and it's pretty naive to think otherwise. Yes, but look, if you take the parallel of Iraq, we supported Saddam Hussein when he was using chemical weapons against the Iranians and indeed against his own people. And look how that turned out. I quite agree with uh, my fellow contributor that uh, it's not the intelligence services that need to be embarrassed, it's the governments. And I have some form on but this. He but said it, he said there's no embarrassment at all. Why would well, you be embarrassed if you protected uh, your national security in doing so? Well, he said that it was, in, as I understood it, that the intelligence service uh, was not embarrassed. I think governments are embarrassed. And as I say, I've got some form on this because I was taken to task after, by a commentator in a national newspaper here uh, after I was thought to be unenthusiastic about the deal which Tony Blair had done. Of course you have to do deals often with people whose methods and whose philosophy you don't like. But that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be fastidious about how you deal with them. Uh, but Michael, sure, presumably, um, if you don't regret what went on there, you must worry for new Libya now uh, if you essentially still believe these men are terrorists. Well, yes, uh, NATO has supplied uh, uh, air support to people who in Afghanistan would be called the Taliban. Uh, you know, we, we walked into this uh, affair in Libya uh, with, with uh, the basis of the revolution coming out of Benghazi, the most strongly Islamist place in, uh, in, um, in Libya. And those people have carried the fighting while pushing forward uh, English-speaking, legalistic intellectuals who, who are on the Transitional Council now. 
Whether that holds uh, steady mm. in the future, I think, is highly unlikely. Uh, so much for the utopia, uh, Min Campbell. How worried are you uh, that the man who's now militarily leading Libya is a former jihadi? You heard uh, in Tim's piece that Sharia will now be mm. a primary source of future legislation, and this man is, is according to my Sharia, jihadi. Well, your correspondent said a moment or two ago, we've got to keep our eye on Libya, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. Mr. Belhaj is extraordinarily short of rancor about any of the things that happened to him, and he does claim uh, that he has abandoned the whole notion of holy war. But it's not what people say which matters, it's what they do, and that's why uh, the West has been at pains to embrace uh, the National Council. Uh, why else was there that meeting yesterday in Paris when we were trying very closely to embrace the leaders uh, of the new Libya in order to ensure that we have some influence uh, in relation to their promises to accept, adopt and implement pluralism. Michael Shorey, do you believe uh, in retrospect that rendition was the wrong policy? No, I think it was absolutely the right policy and it will have to be revived under the next president, whether that's a re-elected Obama or a Republican. So let me just uh, ask, is, is the CIA uh, still monitoring what are essentially the new leaders of Libya now? I would certainly hope so. I don't have any way of knowing, but certainly I would hope they were, would be doing that, ma'am. And, and how do you... I'm going to say there's a fundamental difference uh, on these matters, as far as I'm concerned. Rendition is illegal. Uh, it's illegal in international law, and it's almost certainly illegal in the domestic law of the countries in which it's practiced. And if you accept uh, that rendition is a legitimate means of conducting the campaign against terrorism, uh, then you're giving away an enormous amount of your moral authority. Michael Shoy, a brief response to that. You lose your moral authority by doing so. The moral high ground is where you can shoot your gun straightest from, ma'am. I wouldn't worry about international law for a second if I was in charge of protecting the United States. <laughs> All right, thank you both very much indeed. <laughs>